Seven plus year career. You didn't miss a snap for a while, and then we we know about the injury. So you know it's funny. You were in the world, Mitchell, of Mahomes and Andy Reid. You were at the very start of this thing, and uh, you know it didn't take long for us to see him and go, okay, that's different. I haven't seen a lot of that. Take me back to when you first saw Mahomes practices. Was there a moment, an epiphany for you where you were like, oh, this is exciting. This guy is different. Yeah, he does some different stuff, that's for sure. But in practice, I always defaulted to, oh, it's practice. It's not a real situation. You know, he doesn't have the repercussions of a turnover or an interception, right. one of these things. So let's wait to see it in a game. And then in the preseason, he was on the run he threw this like 60 65 yard bomb on the run that was like perfectly executed and caught and i was like okay that's closer to a real situation (laughs) this is getting good and then uh you know the first year he didn't play until week 17 uh coach reed let me play that game to keep my streak alive and pat played because we had locked up the one seat i believe and uh he went out there he led us on a game-winning touchdown drive at the end you know he threw a pass to our tight end Again, one of those like 30, 40 yard passes downfield. He's scrambling. He chucks it up and like only the tight end can catch it. But the tight end didn't catch it. There's a guy or two draped over him. And I remember going back to him and being like, hey, like, let's be smart. It's a tie game. Let's let's, you know, not turn it over. And looking back, I'm sure he was just like, dude, I got this. I know what I'm doing. Right. But it was one of those things you don't realize. So after the fact that he just had such command of everything that he never really puts the ball in trouble unless he feels like he absolutely needs to. You know, Andy Reid is one of the great play designers and play callers in the sport. And um, but yet they're never generally heavily penalized. Not a lot of turnovers, which would run kind of counterintuitive to a highly complex offense. So take me behind the curtain. Is the Andy Reid, compared to your Cleveland days, is the Andy Reid offense wildly complex, or does he simplify it? It's a little bit of both. It's tough to compare much to the Cleveland days, so that's not (laughs) fair to either side there. But uh, I would say, Coach, I mean, we've seen it. He's got all the personnel packages, the formations, the route combinations, and so he puts a lot on the guy's plate. But I think the smart thing is he does it early in the season, and so – you're getting there in OTAs and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be an easy meeting. And all of a sudden the receivers are hit with 20 formations and they need <laughs> to know, I got to go here, I got to go there. But by the time training camp rolls around, by the time you're halfway through training camp, preseason starts happening, it's like, okay, I've been exposed to everything and now it's starting to slow down and starting to make sense instead of you know starting from zero and then slowly ramping up to 200. And just like, hey, here's 180 of it and try to figure it out and then eventually you'll get it. So it, it's definitely complex, but I think, To your point, he boils it down to its core essence and, hey, we're going to do these core things for you guys. We're going to do these things for the others. You know, he plays on guys' strengths extremely well. I think that's what the best coordinators do and what we've seen. And so it's uh, something he doesn't put more on your plate than you can handle. And I think that's why he's such a great teacher because he understands how to properly teach to his guys. You know, Kyle Shanahan, um, you watch the Niners play. Trent Williams is so good. As you know, as a tackle, he's so good. Some of it is sheer size. He's obviously smart. Uh, He just creates his own inertia. Um, When you look at that Niners team, I've I've been told for years that offensive linemen would rather run block than pass block. They would just love to put it down and roll over guys. When you watch that Niners, you you played for a a, a very pass-centric team. Do you ever watch the Niners and think, man, that would be fun, just rolling over guys for three and a half hours? Oh, absolutely. I got, we got to experience it in Cleveland with Kyle, and that was one of the the more fun offenses I'd been in until you know Super Bowl Mahomes era. And it's just it's exciting. Yeah, Trent is the perfect example of what Kyle wants. You know, he's six five, three thirty. He ran like a four six or something absolutely insane at the combine. And Kyle's biggest pet peeve is that people think, oh, they run outside zone. They're just kind of running around people. They're getting the corner and they're not super physical. And Kyle's like, no, we're gonna run through you. It's just on a slightly wider angle, and Trent can do it as good as anybody. We've seen that this year. You know, on the backside is is where he puts a spin on things. He's got this little technique. He essentially just, like, chops and kind of grabs the guy's back and throws you down. And defense alignment their whole career taught, you know, get your hands in the guy's chest, fire your hands, fire your hands. 
and Trench is back there forcing them to you know fall to the ground when they fire their hands. So now you don't know what to do. And he's got the strength and athleticism to do it. So it's a really fun offense to watch. It's definitely a fun one to play in. And it, it shows up. They're able to get the most out of guys, and especially the quarterback position. You know, Mitchell, it's interesting. Uh, uh, um, Sean McVay came into this league. It was about five, six years ago, five, six years ago with the Rams. And he said, I'm not playing any of my starters in preseason. And a lot of old heads were like, this is not good. And then they started the year 8-0. and And everybody was saying, your team's not going to be ready. you got to be physical. And it's really, it's had an imprint on the league. A lot of coaches, in fact, last year we kind of did a survey of it, overwhelmingly young coaches like Matt LaFleur, they're just not playing starters. Some of the old guys, Bruce Arians, uh, you know, Tomlin, they're going to play some starters. But it is interesting because you play a position offensive line, your hands get mangled, you guys had a lot of back surgeries. It is it is a daunting physical ask. But I do think the NFL's done a really good job. Uh, baseball sometimes can be um, paralyzed by history and tradition. Football will change rules and protocols. I mean, suddenly COVID now has disappeared in the NFL. So take me to your first year in the NFL and your last year in the NFL and how the stuff we don't see. Practice, hitting, nutrition, training has has changed. Oh, it's come a long way. You know, this past CBA definitely tightened up the practice rules a little bit. I got in in 2012, right after the 2011 CBA, and yeah. so as a rookie, you do a rookie mini camp after you're drafted, and you're able to do like two practices. They're much lower tempo. It's not like you're in pads or anything, but. I think in that three-day period, you have about five practices. And I remember after that, our coach was like, all right, guys, that's the last two a day of your life. Because uh, they had just eliminated the actual two days. It's like, okay, this is pretty cool. Yeah. You came from college, you're doing two days. And so practices were still tough. They're three-hour practices, potentially. Um, and then you get to Kansas City, talking about one of the, the old guys who likes to practice hard and play his guys in the preseason. Yeah, uh, Coach Reed is notorious for a pretty rough training camp. And so <laughs> uh, training camp got a little bit harder when I got to him. Um, longer practices, more of a grind. He's got some periods in there where you're running a lot of plays in a row. Uh, obviously, there's a method to his madness, but uh, training camp for him is definitely building up the tolerance so you're able to you know, be in shape throughout the year and you can handle those high workloads. And then now it seems like Every year you get a little bit smarter. You know how to take care of your body a little better. And so training camp just feels a little easier. And then you flip to new rules and it's like, okay, well, now we're only on the field for two hours and 20 minutes. This used to be two hours and 50 minutes. It feels a lot quicker and things are getting better. They're getting uh, in a a better spot for the offense lineman, especially because we do have an O-line guy in charge of the PA. So it's, it's getting healthier and that's what we all wanted. And as to your point, like it's not showing up on the field that there's a huge detriment to it. I know there's the idea that potentially less practice time, the O-line's a skilled position. We're getting a little bit worse over time because of it. Um, but I think guys are still playing at a pretty high level and performing on Sundays. So is your career officially over? Where are you at officially? Yeah, so it's not officially yet. I'm still recovering from the surgery. It's supposed to be a three or four month recovery, ideally. And we're at about month 11 here and I'm still got the nerve pain down my leg. So I still am looking to get 100% healthy and feeling the way I used to feel. And then from there, I can make a determination. But uh, obviously, the season didn't quite work out. And we'll, we'll see what happens next year. But those back surgeries are tough. And this is the second one I've had. So uh, definitely got to take a, a long-term approach in general. Finally, there's four teams left. Rams, Niners, Bengals, Chiefs. Um, I, I know you have a close relationship with Chiefs players. It does feel like to me... Uh, they should be favored. I think their Spags has gotten the defense to play about as well as it can. I thought Honey Badger's loss was really clear. I think he's such an intuitive player. Um, but do you feel like Kansas City should be favored the rest of the way? I think so, and I think they will be if they make it to the next round. Either team that comes out of there, I'd imagine a little bit more favored against the Niners and the Rams, but I would still think favored. It just it seems like they're the most complete team right now, and they've got a been there, done that aspect to them that the Rams don't have. Yeah. And I think coming into the postseason, it was, well, Stafford hasn't been in the playoffs. Is he going to succeed? He had, you know, a rough end of the season. He's popped out two pretty fantastic games. And I think we just want to make sure he does it and proves it to us before we fully buy in on, you know, the Stafford playoff experience. Obviously, on the flip side, the Chiefs, 
been there, done that, you know, looking at four straight AFC championship games hosted at home, first time ever, potentially three straight Super Bowls. So uh, the Chiefs at their best, it's a very complete team. As you said, Spags has the defense rolling and we know what the offense can do. Mitchell, great meeting you. Good talking to you. Say hi to your brother and enjoy yourself and your family, man. Will do. Thanks for having me on. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.